right, thank you, worship team. If you would grab a Bible, turn to John chapter 17. Before we get into the text, um, I need to share with you some news. This morning I was with Gilbert Sanchez and Doreen Sanchez, and uh, they are, Gilbert is in the final stages of passing away, and so we need to pray for them. And our sermon title today is Gaining Strength Through Prayer, Drawing Strength Through Prayer. And so I feel it's appropriate for us. Gilbert's been a member of this church for 50 years. Um, So as a body of Christ, to lift him up in this moment in his family and Doreen. So will you pray with me? God, we, we think about Gilbert, Lord, and... We just pray knowing that he needs your hand, your comfort, and your peace. And we thank you, God, that he is with you, that he knows you. And Lord, we just pray for that connection to the vine to deepen. We pray for Doreen. We pray, God, a prayer of thanks for how much of a rock she is, for Gil, and also, Lord, that you would minister to her, that you would just show her how much you care and how you see her in this moment. We thank you, God, for her love and service as a dutiful wife in this difficult time. In your name we pray, amen. John chapter 17. We're going to read the first five verses. We, I haven't been with you for three weeks, so I'm excited to be in the pulpit again. I've, I've been around, but just not up here. Last week, Mark came back and filled in for me, which was really fun uh, that uh, he got to come back, and uh, I heard so many good stories about his return and Uh, his dedication of little baby James. And so everyone in my family went down and got really sick. So I thought it was providential that he was able to come and and be there and to be with us as a church. With that, I'm going to read to us one of the more beautiful passages in all of Scripture. And what I think is so beautiful about it and what scholars comment and preachers comment about this text is it's really a rare glimpse. A rare glimpse at Jesus' prayer life. A lot of times, the disciples in Scripture will ask Jesus, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Because they're expressing this really um, honest question that comes from a feeling of lack. Like, Jesus, I see how you act and minister in the world, and I see how you go off to pray, and then you come back and you're able to do all these incredible things, and I want to step into that type of ministry and power, but I need to know, Jesus, how do you pray? How is it that you can do this? What access do you have to God and What are the words that come out of your mouth and through your heart to God that allow you to do this? And Jesus is faithful to answer their prayer. And in fact, we pray what's called the Lord's Prayer. But in fact, that's actually not a prayer that Jesus would have prayed, right? That's a prayer that Jesus teaches the disciples to pray. He teaches us to pray for forgiveness and daily bread and, you know, to to call the God of heaven, Father. But Jesus, uh, in John chapter 17, is praying directly to God, and we just get to see and hear how he prayed to his heavenly Father. The way in which Jesus prays. And I really think that if we let these first five verses sink in, they can adjust how we might approach our Heavenly Father. 
So here are these words, John 17, verse 1. And Jesus said this. He looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had before the world began. So the other day, I had made lunch for my son, and my in-laws were over, and my mother-in-law was trying to give me some kudos through talking to my son. And so she said to my son, who's four years old, she said, Remy, isn't it so nice that your dad makes lunch for you? And he really couldn't be bothered, but he took a small moment to turn and look at her and said, oh yeah, that guy, he does whatever I want. And I was like, oh man, it has begun, full on. And I wonder, now we would never dare to say it quite like that, right? We would never dare to say, oh yeah, God, he does whatever I want. But I wonder if our posture in prayer is more like that idea, oh, this guy, yeah, he does whatever I want. Because if I'm being honest, frequently my prayers are like, God, I could use a little help here, and it would be really nice if. And God's okay with however we come to him, but there's a central difference here in the way that Jesus prays from comparing it to that style of prayer. Because we want to stay in control. And when we just bring our list to God and say, I would like this and wouldn't it be nice if, we're still telling God what to do. We're saying, God, this is what is going on with me. This is what I need you to do. Please get on my program. But Jesus' prayer is totally different. And we struggle with this, right? We, we, we want to maintain the illusion in our minds that we are in control and that we can stay in control of our circumstances. But Jesus' prayer is a prayer of glory. It's a prayer of surrendering to God's will. And so one of the things we need to see in Jesus' prayer life that we might gleam is how we approach God. Because, you know, frequently when we pray, and I think this is a healthy thing to do, we look down and we close our eyes. And, you know, we were probably taught that in Sunday school at some point, that that's the posture of humility, which is a beautiful thing. But when Jesus prays, it says that he looks towards heaven. And we can recall other places where Jesus takes this posture, like when he's getting ready to feed the 5,000, he sits his disciples down on the grass, it says in the gospel, and then he takes the bread and the fish that were given to him, and he looks up to heaven, and he breaks them, and he gives thanks, and the multiplication comes from this posture of looking up to heaven. I love how uh, Isaiah puts it in Isaiah 40, 26. says, Lift your eyes and look to the heavens, who created all of these, who brings out the starry hosts, speaking of the stars in the sky, one by one, and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. 
And you can think of what it's like when you look up at those stars and you begin to think of the Creator and who He is and what He's really about and how powerful He is. And also, even in times of need, the psalmist teaches us to look to heaven. He says, I look up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from you, maker of heaven and earth. And so I dare you to pray like this. I dare you to pray a prayer looking up to heaven, acknowledging who God is before you get to your list. Recognizing first who you're speaking to and what's possible when you begin to adjust your way of thinking about how you're going to speak to God. And what Jesus is teaching us in this first line here, he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. He's saying, I'm getting ready to die. I'm getting ready to go to the cross. He already knows God's will. And so you might say, well, I thought I was praying to, you know, change God's will or adjust things. But really, Jesus' prayer is he knows what he has to do. He knows the will of God. And so his prayer is for strength. His prayer is that God would strengthen him to do what he knew he had to do. It's for in supernatural infilling of the glory of God. And I would say that one of the most important prayers, dangerous prayers that we see in the Bible that you could dare to pray can be summarized with one line, God, show me your glory. That takes you from a reactive prayer posture to a proactive prayer posture. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but when you get a new car, when I get a new car, I start to see that kind of car everywhere. Uh, like, Pastor Mark, his final gift to me was he sold me his Prius. And, you know, other than feeling like now everyone just thinks I'm super slow on the road and I'm pathetic because I have a Prius, I also feel a deep communion with all other Prius owners because I see them in the same struggle that I'm in. And I went from a truck to a Prius, so I'm like surrendering the power, you know. But I wonder if God's glory is a bit like this concept where many people are not in ownership of any kind of faith and so they cannot see the places where God's glory is. But once you begin to step in faith and prayer, pray prayers like this, then you see God's glory everywhere. Isaiah in chapter 6 speaks of an image he gets of seeing the throne room of heaven and the cherubim and seraphim are there and they're worshiping in the same way that Peter was just singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then they say, and the whole earth is filled with his glory. And so once you understand God's glory, once you change your posture and you stop saying, God, do my will, and you say, God, your will be done, and you start getting a taste, a glimpse of the glory of God, you can even look backwards on your life 
before you had faith, and you can see how God was shaping your story here and shaping your story there, all so that it would bring you to a moment where you could understand the glory of God. And you can then take your present moment and say, oh, God's glory is in that flower. And God's glory is with my friend as they suffer and pray. And God's glory is with us as we go through difficult times in our lives. And God's glory is everywhere. And what I love about prayer is that you can do it no matter what. Like, no matter what's going on in your life, you can always pray. And you cannot screw it up. It says in Romans, the book of Romans, chapter 8, says that when you pray that you don't even know sometimes the words that you should say. But that the Holy Spirit is there as a translator. That he takes your wordless groans. He knows your heart. He knows the thing before words that's inside of your spirit, the indwelling of God in your spirit that's trying to come out. And he hears that. Have you ever had God answer a prayer and you were like, God, I didn't even pray that. But he knew it was on your heart. He knew that there was something going on inside of you that really needed something. And he's just like, here, have this. That's because he hears your heart's cry. And so a lot of prayer can be kept and protected and preserved and brought forth to heaven, not through us clamoring for the right words to say, but through simply changing our understanding of why we're praying to believe that our prayers will conform us to the will of God. And the beauty of that promise is that it will create all kinds of glory. There's the glory of Jesus surrendering himself, seeing that place in heaven as not a place that he was going to say, but willfully stay, but willfully surrendering himself, taking on the form of a servant called kenosis in the Greek, which is a self-emptying, that Jesus emptied himself, it says in Philippians chapter 2, and that when he emptied himself, then when he took the form of a servant, then God lifted him up and resurrected him and then brought him into the seat in the heavenly realms. And so our prayer could just be like making ourselves empty before God, like Whatever is on our heart, the anxiety, the fears, the frustrations, we can just say, God, will you empty me of this and fill me up with you, with your love? That's God the Father's gift to the Son, right? At his baptism, he just says, this is my Son whom I love. If you want to know what God is like, ask somebody who has a deep prayer life. I've never met somebody who has a deep prayer life who came back to me and said, God is such a scornful, wrathful God. I have only met people with a deep deep prayer life who have said, do you understand the love and depth of God? How much he loves all of us? And that is what we see in God through Jesus, right? Because he says, God, you gave me authority over this group of people to care for them, to love them, and I've done what you asked me to do. And that authority thing really uh, has always astonished me. When I was in college, I've told you a little bit about this experience before, but I got a chance. I really wanted to learn how to become a preacher, but I had no idea how to do it. So I 
when I was in high school, I went on this little trip to an Indian reservation. We built houses and did a kids' club. And there was also a speaker, but the speaker was like a college student. And when I was in high school, I was like, oh, yeah, like, nobody here really knows what they're doing, but they get to be in charge, which I was really into because I was like, I don't like having bosses. So I'd like to do this little summer experience here where I can go learn how to uh, preach. And so I, I preached some terrible sermons <laughs> to these high schoolers that were on these mission trips, but the Lord, you know, he was there. But we would go to church on Sunday, and we were on this, we were at this Pentecostal church on an Indian reservation, and it was on fire every Sunday. And the preachers were unbelievable. And I would just sit there and think of, like, what I needed to say the next day versus what they just said, and I'd just be like, oh my gosh, this is not okay. And I remember one time I turned to one of the gals that I worked with, and I'm I said to her, I said, how do they preach with such authority? I don't understand it. And she just turned to me and she said, well, I think they pray for it. And I was just like, oh, okay, cool. Maybe I should add that to my prayer request list. But I do think that that's what God does, right? When you actually make it a habit to pray, he begins to change the way that you pray. He teaches you over time, if you're willing to learn, better prayers. Like, God, God, I can't do this, but you can give me the authority to do this. So I pray for that, because I want to see your glory. And do you know that you are an answer to Jesus' prayer? That the gift that God gave to Jesus was you, and then Jesus stewarded you so well by living out the will of God and teaching the disciples about his love and showing them how to do ministry, that they came all the way to you and now you're always eternally on Jesus' prayer list. And every time you move closer into getting a glimpse of the glory of God, Jesus is lifting you up to God and saying, look at your glory, God, that you gave me, that I'm giving back to you as a gift. Is that what you think about when you think about God and Jesus and how they're interacting with you? That, they're, that Jesus is there if you're faithfully trying to live out any kind of walk with him. That he's just there going, God, check them out. Look what you did, God. Look how amazing and beautiful and glorious it is that you were able to do this. See your glory through this. I heard a preacher summarize the gospel with two lines recently, and that stuck with me. The cross and the resurrection. The cross. All is forgiven. The resurrection. All will be well. Now I was listening to Caleb on the way here, and there was one of those little segments about uh, like a, a pastor moment. And it was talking about how one of the things Jesus was so, so astonished by when he was on earth was that people did not have faith. And I was thinking about that on the drive, like, man, that stings a little bit. Because it's like we feel our humanness. We feel this sense of like, gosh, I don't want Jesus to be disappointed in the fact that I don't have that kind of faith or belief. But we also have to consider from Jesus' point of view that he was living in light of what the verse 5 says, where he's saying, God, I was there with you before the creation of the world. I've seen your glory, and I want to come back. I long to come back to be with you in that glory. And how he could see the spiritual realm. 
and how, must, how it must have kind of broke his heart looking down on us when we couldn't see what we had access to. And so my prayer for us is that we would learn to adore Jesus through prayer. And that we would see ourselves in light of the will of God. And the promise from Thessalonians is that if we walk out what God calls us to do, then he will give us God in order to complete the work that he's given us. So he never calls us to something he wouldn't equip us to do. He always strengthens us if we're stepping in his will. And so all we have to do is ask, seek, and knock. And the door will be open to us. And may we align ourselves with God and his will so that we can see his glory all around. All is forgiven. All will be well. May we live in accordance with these sacred truths. Let's pray together. Lord, you say that the sheep of your flock know your voice. And so I pray that as we head to communion now and we take moments of silent reflection that you would speak, tune our ears to heaven's voice. Help us to live in light of who you are and to feel you move us into deeper and deeper communion with your great love expressed through your sacrifice of body broken and blood poured out. In your name we pray. Amen.